Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this, the latest Burn News Facebook Live interview. I'm joined today by the Premier and Finance Minister David Burr. Mr Burr, thank you very much. Premier, I should say, not Mr Burr, I apologise. Thank you very much for sparing some time. Okay. I know you're relatively tight for time, so hopefully we'll get through most of the questions and we'll, we'll see how far we get. Uh, we were just talking off camera a little bit and I, and, I, and I mentioned that to me it seems to have been an exceedingly busy first few months as Premier, both domestically and, and externally. Um, a lot of legislation has gone through. You've, you've accomplished a heck of a lot. If, if you could tell me what you think your top three accomplishments are to date, mm -hmm. what would you say? Well, I think that the uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here as well, and I uh, welcome the opportunity to speak uh, to your uh, watching audience, um, those here in Bermuda and those around the world. Um, I would, if I want to speak to the top accomplishment, I think the top accomplishment would certainly be the fact that Bermuda is not on the uh, list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes by the but European Union. I, that's obviously one of my questions, so well, I'll come I, to that I, 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 I'm certain at some point in time <laughs> uh, you'll get to that question, Jeremy, but I think that that, that is important. I think what, the second thing, I'm not going to pick out a specific item, but what I'm going to say is that the Cabinet has been able to make significant progress on our throne speech initiatives, which we've laid out, and we've been able to put a number of uh, platform uh, items into action. And the third thing I would say is that um, apart from that, I think that just by what is being taking place in Bermuda, insofar as relationships that we're having not only with the uh, opposition, at a meeting and a briefing with the uh, members of the opposition economic team earlier today, right. but also inside of the community, whether it was uh, last evening I hosted a dinner with um, uh, reinsurance leaders, uh, meeting with the unions and the relations, trying to make sure that we have a better community approach uh, to issues that we face as a country, and I think that that is something that's important. That goes under the radar a bit, that kind of thing, it doesn't does. it? It's, it's soft, but the fact mm. is that in order for us to succeed in Bermuda, we have to be able to work together, and we have to be able to disagree in a fashion that does not damage us internationally. So you see that kind of uh, communication going on? Long term. Yeah, I mean, we're working with it. I mean, and it's something that we have to continue to work on. It's not easy. Uh, politicians, it's difficult sometimes for us to uh, resist the urge and temptation to go straight into political battle. Uh, but that much being said, I think the people who um, elected us um, want us to uh, address issues in a mature fashion. So when I speak to people, whether it's when I speak to international business leaders where I say no surprises, or when I speak to people um, in Parliament where I say I want to be known um, as a no drama administration, we're just going to do our best to just say, stick to the facts, go with what we're doing, and we're not going to get uh, stuck into engage in the uh, what I call a lot of times petty back and forth. Um, you mentioned the EU, and obviously it's one of the questions I was going to ask, but I was going to ask it in the context that there seem to be a lot of external threats to Bermuda at the moment. And I, if you don't mind, I want to go through them one by one. That's perfectly fine. Um, so we can deal with them individually so we don't get them confused. And this, this is, I'm surmising that these are external threats, and obviously I'd like your opinion on these. We're seeing, um, it, I'll start again, in, in your predecessor's uh, last budget, Bob Richards, um, there's a quote where he said, the scenario whereby US corporate taxes are cut to such an extent that there will, be no, there will no longer be a comparative advantage to use the facilities that Bermuda offers is now possible. And that was last February. And of course, since then, we've seen passing through the Congress and the Senate of the tax reform bill, and we've seen the potential for corporate tax to be lowered to around 20%. How big a threat is that now to Bermuda? Because it's becoming reality, or it's close to becoming reality. Um, well, it all depends, um, and it depends on who you ask as the level and scale of a threat. The one thing that I would make clear is that tax reform in the United States has not yet been passed, no. and the details of which are inside of that bill are, are, now, are not yet known. But the headline so figures seem to be well, well, the headline figure is that if you go ahead and if that happens, then certainly uh, there will be some challenge to the way that we operate in Bermuda. But when we talk about, when we speak to the insurance leaders and the reinsurance leaders of what they've said is that part of the reason for locating Bermuda is not just um, the uh, tax neutrality that Bermuda offers, but it's also the uh, the regulatory regime that we have. And it's easier to, to transact business in, in the, across the market in the United States from Bermuda than it is inside of the United States. And so we offer uh, distinct regulatory advantages, and I think we will continue to maintain those regulatory advantages. For you're going to you're gonna have to maintain those regulatory oh, we, advantages, well, yes. I mean, that's going to be crucial for you if that's, well, if that's the deciding factor. Absolutely. And I think that from that perspective, that's where we're going to continue to be. Um, but we have an excellent working relationship with um, 
the, uh, the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers. Uh, we've been working with them regarding uh, our lobbying efforts, which are taking place in the U.S. Congress, our public advocacy there. Um, and also, uh, we work with them in the, uh, in the EU with issues facing there. So our, our relationship is strong. Our relationship will continue to be strong, and we will face these challenges together. But Bermuda is more than just a tax benefit. It's a regulatory benefit, and we have a very well-advanced market here. You're obviously not relaxed about the situation, but you seem fairly confident about it. Is that a fair summation? It's not a question of confidence. We cannot control what the U.S. does with their tax laws. Oh, clearly, the only thing which the we can control is stuff. how we do things here in the Bermuda context and making sure that we continue to work together so that Bermuda can be successful in business, and we're going to continue to do that. You mentioned the lobbying going on there, mm -hmm. and I was going to ask you about that, because I just wonder realistically what is that you can do to try and influence uh, the U.S. authorities. Is the lobbying part very important? Um, well, it is. I think that it's a question of when you talk about what happens in the Gulf states, particularly Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Florida, um, and even South Carolina and North Carolina, states which have a uh, high exposure to hurricanes, when you're speaking about what basically the U.S. Congress are looking to do, which is to put in place what we've called a hurricane tax, it means that it will increase the price of uh, that, that insurance. And if you speak to uh, representatives who represent those particular states, they're very concerned because insurance coverage is very difficult to get for those mm -hmm. states, and it will be more difficult for them, and it will drive up the cost. So what you will find is that less the people inside of those states will be able to have insurance coverage, and that means that the states will then have to take on that uh, risk or that rebuilding should um, should the uh, should should whatever happens in sure. Congress take place. So clearly there are people that are concerned, and we just have to make sure in the same way that we do in the European Union to educate lawmakers in the United States what the repercussions of their actions are. So a lot of lobbying efforts gone into that area. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and it's, it, it's, it, it's important. It's stuff that we've mm. done for a very long time. But what I told the, uh, there was an ABR board meeting yesterday, and I thanked ABR for their work because the government of Bermuda has not had an actual lobbying effort in Bermuda this entire year. In, 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 in Washington, D.C., sorry, yeah. in Washington, yeah. D.C. And we did not have an official lobbying presence until November, and I actually think that that's an abdication of responsibility, is, to it, be it, completely honest. Was that why you had the three-month uh, contract for the lobbying firm? Well, we had a three-month contract because we that a contract that's going to be over the size yeah. of $100,000. The oh, financial so, instructions right. require it to go out to tender. Um, you mentioned that it's good to get clarification on that, and hopefully that's been useful for the, for the viewers as well. Now, the other thing, of course, and you touched on it already, we, we've touched on it, is the EU. Um, a couple of weeks ago, they issued a statement. And I'm not going to read it all because it's way too long. <laughs> and it, I don't think anybody would understand it. Well, it's all a question. The EU issued a statement, so was that the European Council or was that the European Commission? Because it all depends. There's so okay. many different it parts of the EU. It was the ECNHR or something, I, don't okay. know, I can't remember. But it was Section 2, Fair Taxation, Section 2.2, mm -hmm. two, existence of tax regimes that facilitate offshore structures which attract profits without real economic activity. Mm -hmm. The following jurisdictions are committed to addressing the concerns relating to economic substance by 2018, and of course mm -hmm. Bermuda's there. Now, and then after that I think we had the fiscal responsibility panel, the three wise men if you like, and they came out and said, I know you don't like this phrase, but I'm, I'm quoting them, not me, mm -hmm. um, it, Bermuda, has been grey listed and government has been given a year to do something about companies here without any substantive presence. What's your interpretation? Well, I'm curious as to that quote because the Fiscal Responsibility Panel's report has not yet been released. This is an interim report, I think. Well, I no, there has been no report that has been released by the Fiscal Responsibility Panel, so I just want to clarify oh. uh, that particular instance. I think the Fiscal Responsibility Panel's report will be released it's next imminent, week, yeah. and as we know that there are various organizations which are not always very accurate in their reporting, so I don't think that we should rely on what they say. The fiscal, <laughs> the fiscal okay, responsibility well, panel fine. will but, have their report and when it comes out we can judge it from there. But going back to the basic statement of the European relating Union. Relating to economic substance. Mm -hmm. that's the cru that seems to be the crux, the crucial part. Well, of it. What's, I, your, what's your interpretation? I, I, well, I would say that that of course is something that people want to draw attention to. We take it from the first part of the statement and it talks about facilitating structures which attract profits inside of a jurisdiction. And what I've said uh, publicly is that we have, Bermuda is one of the leading countries in adopting uh, country by country reporting for our, for our multinational enterprises. And so for countries that operate throughout the world, global enterprises, they're required to declare their income and expenses on a country by country basis. So if you have 
have country by country reporting and you are sharing that information automatically with the European Union members who are signed up to this, mm -hmm. some of them who are not signed up to this regime. So we are more advanced than many of the European countries themselves who have signed up to this regime. If you do that, then you minimize the opportunity for profits being in a jurisdiction that do not reflect economic activity there. And so we're going to engage in the dialogue with the European Union to find out what specific additional concerns they may have. But it is our view that by and large, because we are early adopters of country by country reporting and because we have these items, it basically states, they, so they're worried about the erosion of their tax base. That's what they're worried about. But if we are telling them how much money is being made inside of your country, that alleviates those concerns. I was going to ask you if, if, you, if you had clar clarification from the EU about this. You are, you've got meetings lined up, presumably, to talk about this? Uh, we, we have a full schedule of engagement that's going to take place over the next year. Uh, we've committed to continue the dialogue with the European Union Code of Conduct Group. But the European Union is a very important partner for Bermuda. And we, um, a, we do lots of business with Europe. Our insurance companies do a lot of business with Europe. And we're going to continue to be an important partner to the European Union. We are not a non-cooperative jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. We are the definition, and as you've heard me say before, the Bermuda Standard, we are leading the other overseas territories in what it means to be a cooperative jurisdiction, and we're going to continue to assert that leadership. It's interesting. I was going to, one of my follow-up questions was, was going to be about how important the EU is to Bermuda mm -hmm. and how important the EU stance is to Bermuda. Yeah. How, how important is it? I mean, if the EU comes out and says Bermuda is now blacklisted, mm -hmm. what, what are the net effects going to be? Well, oh, that's a funny thing. I mean, it, it, what is so interesting inside of this entire circumstance is everyone's worried about the countries that were not blacklisted because they wanted them to be blacklisted and not worried about the countries that are. I mean, they have South Korea on a black. I mean, you're talking about a G20, an OECD country, that ends up on a blacklist of non-cooperative tax jurisdictions. You have the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, you know, that are on a blacklist. I'm quite certain that the European Union is not going to stop having investment flows from the UAE, nor are they going to ban the import of Samsung phones so they can't have them from South Korea. So I think that the EU is working through their process. This is, by and large, something that has a political dimension to it as well. But as I said, we are going to continue to cooperate with the European Union throughout this point. We're going to, as I said, we had a meeting and briefing with members of the opposition today. So they were all here in this particular room. Next week, we have a meeting with uh, industry representatives to let them know where we stand to alleviate any fears or concerns. And we're going to work through this process in a very deliberate fashion. In the end, we're going to make sure that Bermuda is going to continue to be a strong economy and we are not going to put ourselves at a competitive disadvantage and sign up to things that other countries have not done themselves. Um, you were recently in London with the Prime Minister Theresa May uh, for a meeting of the UK Overseas Territories, um, Council of the UK Overseas Territories. Mm -hmm. um, and afterwards, Downing Street issued a statement, and I just, it's quite lengthy, but I have to read it, so it's in context. Um, the Prime Minister recognised that a lot of work had been done following the Panama Papers last mm -hmm. year. She thanked the territories for the leadership they have already shown, including steps they have already taken to implement international standards, and asked for similar leadership to show what more can be done to make further progress on the issue. Uh, I'm kind of interpreting that as in relation to the Paradise Papers. And politically, when you get a statement like that, it can be interpreted as saying, you must do more. Mm -hmm. What was the kind of conversation? What was your interpretation of that? What was the conversation with the Premier or, uh, surrounding the Paradise Papers? Well, the only thing with that the, I, the Prime Minister. With the only thing that I can say on that particular topic is I think that we were all strong in our assertion that we have done more than the other countries that have criticized us. And that is what the United Kingdom government is that's position of which the United Kingdom government has to carry. Um, there is a political debate inside of the uh, inside of the UK regarding from, of course, the leader of the Labour Party, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who wants to bang the hammer and talk about the need for a public register of beneficial ownership. The only real country in the world that has a semi-public register of beneficial ownership is the United Kingdom. What we have told Her Majesty's government is very clear, is that when the OECD and or the G20 mandates public registers of beneficial ownership inside of their countries and it is enforced by the G20, then the Bermuda government will happily accede to the international standard. But until that point in time, we will not. 
So there's no more you can do. When, when there the is no more says, we do, do more. Well, I mean, if, if other countries did as much as Bermuda did, then I think that we would uh, have less of a discussion on these particular points. So we want other people to catch up to where we are before we start acceding to demands to do more. Just before I come on to the next external threat, when you say that, how can you, how can you get that message across? That? How can you pull everybody up to your standards? Well, the one thing in which you have to understand, Jeremy, and I think you do understand, is that some people don't want to get the message. Some people, for domestic political concerns, such as the leader of the opposition in the United Kingdom, will continue to bang on about tax havens and dirty money. The fact of the matter is that it is far easier to launder money in the United Kingdom than it is in Bermuda. So he should probably worry about his own backyard more than he should worry about Bermuda. Have you thought about meeting? Um, we've had numerous requests and attempts to have meetings with Mr. Corbyn, and he has rejected and denied them at every opportunity. Mm -hmm. It is very unfortunate. Was he given a reason? Um, maybe he doesn't want to meet with the leader of a so-called tax haven. <laughs> um, Brexit. Um, who knows what's happening with Brexit? Well, there seems to finally be some developments there. But they, they seem to be talking points over that final development. A, 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 which is precisely what we're seeing in the US on tax reform. Very much so. Um, is there a concern from your point of view that once Brexit does happen, if it ever happens, that Britain will no longer have a seat at the table at the EU and no longer be able to speak on behalf of uh, territories like Bermuda? Um, yes, that is a legitimate fear. Um, and that's the reason why we are making sure that we form our own relationships in Brussels and we're going to have important representation in Brussels. And so one of the things that you've heard me speak about um, in our throne speech and otherwise is that we need to have permanent representation in the European Union, just like we have permanent representation in Washington, D.C. And over the coming months, we'll be speaking about the actions of which we're going to take in that regard. You but have a physical is, presence there. Yeah, but I mean, it's absolutely important to do so. I mean, physical presence takes lots of different forms. The fact is that we are very constrained financially, so we have to be prudent in our operations. But the fact is that we have a very important trading partner in the European Union, and we need to make sure that our relations there can exist after the EU leaves, uh, sorry, after the UK leaves the EU. And lastly, uh, next year, I believe, is an inspection of Bermuda's anti-money laundering regime. Sorry. I don't know that happened. Go ahead. Um, can you explain what that is about and whether that, how that could be construed as a threat? Because there's an issue if you don't pass. Mm -hmm. What happens? Uh, well, there is without question an issue if you don't pass, then we're in a bad state. But it's not a pass-fail, it's an overall um, inspection of okay, our, I, our, our regime. The way I, way I heard it, it was like it, you have ten areas, but yeah. if you fail one, you fail all. Exactly. What, what I can tell you is that the government um, has been working feverishly um, in, con in consultation with the private sector as well to make sure that we are at a standard where we will continue to, uh, where we will continue to have um, an excellent uh, regulatory structure and people will look at Bermuda's system and say that they are not a place, they have protections in place to prevent money laundering. And I think that we, are, we certainly have done so. It is incredibly bothersome uh, for citizens. It's incredibly bothersome to have to fill out these number of forms that, that the banks require and otherwise. But part of that is when you talk about looking to the future, looking to technology, looking to how we can do these things more efficiently. And during all of this at the same time, the government is talking about how we can support companies that are looking to make this process more efficient so that Bermuda can be a leader in not only global compliance, but also the technology technology that surrounds global compliance to make it easier uh, for, uh, for compliance to happen and more efficient for those things to take place. So it'll be a lot easier that instead of filling out all these multiple forms at every single bank, you fill out one form, it's held in a single repository, and it can be shared automatically. Those are the type of things in which we're looking at from a technological basis. And though there are companies in Bermuda that do this, there are companies otherwise that are looking to set up to do those type of things. And those, is what we, and those are the type of things that we are supporting via the BDA. I know a few people uh, who will be listening to this will be music to their ears. Okay. I've seen <laughs> a few people. <laughs> I, think all of us, <laughs> I think all of us desk. want to get to a point where we only have to fill out these forms once as opposed to every year and multiple times. The, the inspection uh, next year, is this one of the reasons why betting shops, that is regulation of betting shops, was passed to the Gaming Commission? Well, regulation of betting shops is something that uh, the former government wanted to give to the Gaming Commission and the Gaming Commission actually told them no. 
you know why? I have no idea why. But because I know I, they have got. But what I can it. tell you is that now they must follow the directions of the minister responsible, and they will be getting betting shops. And betting shops needs to be make sure they are being regulated, and we need a structure in order to do that. Is, it, is this part of the inspect because of the inspection? Next Absolutely. Year? I think that we need to cover all areas where there's any possibility of money laundering, and that is that's to say in everything. I mean, there's possibility of money laundering um, throughout the country. That's just something uh, that exists all the time. Is it a perfect storm for Bermuda, brewing on the horizon? Um, I don't know if it's a perfect storm uh, for Bermuda. I think that Bermuda is well positioned in a lot of particular areas. Our insurance industry is well regarded. We still have a very good international reputation. Uh, we have opportunities to advance here. Our platform is something that people like, um, and it's a good place. And you, know, you can see it's an absolutely beautiful country. So it's a place where we want people to live and to work. What we have to, as a people, recognize is that in order to have economic growth, we need to make sure that we have more people living and working in Bermuda. That's one thing I want to touch on later on, actually. Um, at the end of the day, though, you know, you, you talk about Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. It's not inconceivable that he could be in power at the next election. No, not at all. And, and for people like him, Bermuda is very politically expendable, isn't it? Well, it can be politically expendable as much as he likes. Unfortunately for Jeremy Corbyn, the law matters. And as much as he believes that he can legislate uh, our laws from the United Kingdom, um, it is not possible for them to pass orders in council without our consent. We have a legal ruling that supports that. And so Mr. Corbyn can continue his grandstanding. I mean, I would love to sit down and talk with the leader of the Labour Party as a fellow leader of the Labour Party uh, here. And hopefully we'll have that opportunity next year. I, I use that as an example, but I mean, it could equally apply to the U.S. authorities. Mm -hmm. Bermuda is very expendable if mm -hmm. it benefits the U.S. They're not going to blink an eyelid over Bermuda, are they? Mm -hmm. Um, I, well, I would say no, but the thing is that there always are repercussions which exist. So just like when we're talking about taxes, and just like we're talking about the fact that people may end up losing their insurance coverage or have their insurance coverage uh, go up, there's consequences to every type of particular action. So I think that we, our job is to make sure we educate people on the value proposition of Bermuda, the role of which we play in the global economy, and the good partner of which we have always been to the United States, the United Kingdom, and the partner that we will continue to be to the United States, United Kingdom. You kind of come full circle to the beginning, but mm -hmm. um, I don't want to dwell on it because thousands of words have been spoken and, and written about this, but I do want to talk about the Paradise Papers very quickly. No problem. Uh, do you see a, a long-term uh, reputational issue for Bermuda out of that? The, the reason I ask that is because I, I was reading the paper yesterday, one, one of the UK papers yesterday, the day before. Uh, it was a Guardian, of course. A Guardian. Of course it was a Guardian. But they didn't reference the Paradise Papers, but it talked about the World Inequality Report, and mm -hmm. that showed the richest 0.1% of the world's population have increased their combined wealth by as much as the poorest 50% in the world. Mm -hmm. It did reference the Paradise Papers, of course. Now, you can talk as much as you like about how well regulated it is, etc., etc., but that is what people hear, isn't it? Well, it's fine that people hear that, Jeremy, uh, but here's the fact. There is nothing that Bermuda can do to change its laws that will fix that problem. Mm. Those are the facts. Mm. That problem is something. We can fix that problem here, but if we're talking on a global level, there's an issue. When you talk about reputation from the Paradise Papers, I think our reputation was enhanced because the fact is that unlike other releaks and leaks, there was no illegal activity that was found. Absolutely. And so from that perspective, it shows that we do regulate our affairs very well. And in that, t and, and in that context, the simple message that I give to persons when I meet is that it is not for Bermuda to change their laws. It is for the United Kingdom or other home countries to change their laws. If they don't like the activity of which they're seeing, then they are perfectly happy to make changes in their laws to basically, if they want, to tax their citizens more than they do currently. I'm talking about perceptions. When I say that's what people hear, mm -hmm. I'm talking about perceptions, and that builds a groundswell. And here's the thing. You're never going to change perception when you are a, uh, when you're a, corporate, when you're a country that has a different type of taxation than others. And politically, people will continue to bang on about it. But what we have to understand is that's the Guardian. Uh, another, uh, what I'm saying is, another, Guardian, is uh, I mean, I, I'm but saying another newspaper may take a different position. So at the same point in time when you have Jeremy Corbyn who will say something, you'll also have other politicians who will say other things. Well, the so telegraph the, wasn't uh, particularly complimentary. I understand. But what I'm saying is that there is a balance of items. So you have to understand that although someone may be the loudest voice in the room, that doesn't mean that they're the only voice in the room. Um, debt is an ever-present issue. Um, you were speaking in, in the House earlier this month, and um, 
You said it was estimated the public debt net of sinking fund will be about 2.48 million, billion, I beg your pardon, billion, billion would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, and then, of course, that was followed up by the Auditor General who came out and said Bermuda's debt was actually 3.7 billion. Mm -hmm. What's Which, the difference between the two? What, what, what is the debt? Uh, the debt, um, as per the accounting standards of the Constitution of this country, uh, our net debt will stand at $2.48 billion. So where did the Auditor General get The Auditor General seven? always uses a different type of calculation uh, for her debt figures. Um, and But what I can say is that the debt figure, uh, which is accorded to the debt from our definition side of our Constitution, is just shy of $2.5 billion. So how does the Auditor General, and I, I, I can't would, ask I, the Auditor General this, unfortunately. I, I, I think but, that you should have probably better. Do you, do you have an idea of where? Um, I, 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 do, I do know the answer. I don't know it off the top of my head. I think it, it has to deal with, I think that maybe uh, she takes into account um, underfunding of pensions or something. I'm not entirely sure. I was going to ask, I was going to ask I'm, I'm pensions sure. she, 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 takes, she takes other things into account that are not done from the uh, pure accounting center. Well, hopefully we'll get an interview with the Auditor General if mm -hmm. she's listening. We'll sure. To do that. I think you should. Um, of course, she then she does go on to say, and I, I believe that the government needs to take concerted action to address this fiscal challenge. Now, I don't want to sound disrespectful to the Auditor General. That's a statement of the obvious. But can you outline the steps you're doing? I mean, that's the same statement that Auditor Generals have been making for a number of years. But, and from that perspective, uh, what we're doing, and the most important thing of which we can do, is to make sure that we return our economy to a path of growth. That is the only thing that we can do. It is about growing. So yes, we'll be certainly more efficient inside of the government. Yes, we'll be more efficient inside the civil service. We said of what we're going to do in so far as doing our best to hold spending at current levels while we get uh, revenues up and doing and by and the only the best way to do that is by creating growth in this economy, more opportunity and more jobs in Bermuda uh, for Bermudians. However, <laughs> when I that say that doesn't happen overnight, though, oh, it, it absolutely that's a long term project. It, it, well, it, it's a long term project, but I mean, I think that there are certain things that you can see that can certainly benefit that. Uh, the long-term issue is when we're talking about debt, the close, what we have to do is we have to get ourselves to a balanced budget. That's the key. That's the first target. So we all we want to talk about debt, the first target is to get to a balanced budget. Um, when I deliver uh, the budget statement or when this government delivers this budget statement in 2019, we expect to deliver a budget statement that will say that the budget will be balanced uh, for that fiscal year. Uh, this year, when we go, we are expecting that we will not see any increase in our net debt. We're expecting that the borrowing that will be happen will only be to cover our contribution to the sinking fund, and that means that there will actually be no actual increase in net debt. So basically our debt, the, the expectation is in this budget year, we'll be able to say that we are no longer increasing debt, and once we get to a balanced budget position, then we can actually start reducing our debt. A couple of things from that, and I know um, you're not too keen to talk about talking about the, uh, the, the, the three wise men, as I, as I call them, but they did talk about some budget slippage. Oh, absolutely. There yeah. has been budget there slippage. Has. Right. So is it, is it like, I mean, there was a, an idea that it was hoped you'd balance the budget by 2018-19. Now they're saying 2019-20. Well, 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 is that, well, is that well, likely I, to be the case? I, 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 I can assure you that, <laughs> that it is, that is every expectation of this government. That, on the, that when we deliver our budget statement in February 2019, that we will project a balanced budget. That much I can assure you, and that is the specific expectation of the That'll be for the 1920 fiscal year. Yeah, yes, but yes, in 2019. So there won't be a balanced budget when he, when he, not, not next when year? Not when we go to Parliament in February, no. Right. Not when we go to Parliament in February, and that, it, that's just not going to happen. But I think from the perspective of what the Fiscal Responsibility Panel said, and this is important, they said that the projections which were made by the former government have not been met. And clearly they haven't been met. The question is why, Jeremy? Well, and that is because we have not had the economic growth which we need to have in order to grow the economy and to grow revenues. That's the challenge. The challenge of which we have is to grow the economy. That is our number one focus. And I think that is the context in which that needs to be looked at. Is, is that referring to the, they refer to slippage, is that what you were talking Absolutely. about? Absolutely. That's, that's where it is. I mean, but, the, but I spoke about the slippage when I gave my budget reply last year in Parliament because there were projections which were made by the former Minister of Finance and those projections were not met. And that is the slippage of which they're talking about and that's yes. the slippage of which we're referencing. I understood. Do you know what caused that? Do you, do you know what um, the underlying causes were? I just stated did that. It, the economy did it, not grow it was literally as just much as, as it was. Yes. So I there mean, was no question of overspending here well, or overspending well, I mean, there, there was a or little bit budgeting. of Spending and maybe your revenues come in less than you expect all the rest, but the baseline 
reason so is. So the forecast growth wasn't as, as big as it was. Precisely. We have not had enough growth inside of our economy. The thing is that if we had 2,000 more jobs in our economy mm. now than we do, Clearly. The, the conversation changes. So that's our target. That's what we're looking at. And that's where we're focused. That's something I want to touch on later on. Um, but I want later to, on? It, it, hopefully we'll have time later <laughs> on. I'm not talking about all afternoon, um, but I, I want I'm, I'm, I'm being careful. I want to go through this step by step. Okay. I think because it's such a complicated uh, subject. And just so you're aware, Jeremy, I'm just saying that when it comes budget time, I'll be more than happy to discuss the budget with you at length in case you want to move on to other issues. Because I'm not going to lay out the budget. I mean, no, if I could, the budget, but there are certain things but we are having. Domain, but no? we are having a pre. We are returning to an open budget process again. Right. So we will be publishing our pre-budget report uh, next week, which will lay out all the challenges which we're facing okay. and the decisions of which the Ministry of Finance is looking at doing in order uh, to um, in order to consider putting together the final budget. I'm just really looking at the at the uh, the things already in the public domain, and one of those mm -hmm. is this line of credit. Uh, with Butterfield Bank. Mm -hmm. Can you just expand on that? What's, what's that about? Um, that's, as I said, that's just short-term borrowing uh, that's needed to meet our obligations. So you are, because you, you weren't, as I understood it, you weren't sure if you would draw on that. Um, you, it you, will, you be will be drawn on, but we only draw, we only, so we're not taking 135 at once. Mm -hmm. We only take what is needed. And how, do, you, do you anticipate using all of it? Um, we anticipate using it shortly. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we anticipate using all of it. That was the figure that was projected. Mm -hmm. uh, revenues are tracking a little bit higher than they were expected. Uh, we do know that we've had some unanticipated expenses which were related to the America's Cup and others, uh, which we inherited. So we'll see where we stand. Okay, moving on now, something completely different. Um, one of the things that's been in the headlines over and over and over again uh, is the same-sex marriage issue. Um, there's been lots of debate, and we don't have to go back into the ins and outs of it, but I am kind of intrigued by a couple of statements that are being made, one by the Human Rights Commission um, yesterday, um, early this week. Bermuda gained the shameful honour of being the first jurisdiction to allow marriage equality and then remove and replace it with legislation that is aimed clearly at being separate and unequal. Do you see it as shameful? Um, what I see it is the fact that this is a government that will make the difficult decisions and will lead when it's necessary and required. The former government abdicated its responsibility. The former government dithered on this issue on numerous occasions. We are going to take the bull by the horns so that we can put this issue behind us and we can focus on the issues that matter uh, more to a wider section of this country, and that is jobs and economic growth. It is very important that the economy, is, that the government is focused on those particular issues. In relation to this, uh, the issue of same-sex relationships, same-sex couples, after the passage of the Mexican Partnership Act, enjoy more legal benefits than they previously had. That is something that is being missed in the hysterics of which is coming through in the international media and those persons who want to find a way to attack the progressive Labour Party government. What happened previously before is that, for instance, same-sex couples did not have rights to pensions, did not have rights to uh, survivorship benefits, uh, hospital visitation, um, health insurance rights prior to the past of the Domestic Partnership Act. They now have those benefits which they did not previously have. We believe that that is an improvement in the position of where we had, and we recognize that this is a compromise that both sides do not like. But that's what happens sometimes when you compromise. The Human Rights Commission went on to say we must stem the attack and erosion of human rights that has been pervasive over the past two years of our tenure. Uh, do you see there's been an erosion of human rights when it comes no, to same-sex marriage? No, I don't. No? No. Nope, For I the do. reasons stated about giving I, more I, rights? I, I, what, what I'm saying is I don't agree with that perspective. And what we can understand is that different people may have different opinions on this. But the fact is, under the laws of which Bermuda is ascribed to, same-sex marriage is not a human right under the European Convention of Human Rights. It is not. They have said that. That is the fact. So people can have their own opinions. People can say what they like to say. We like to deal in the place of reality. And the place of reality is that after the passage of the Domestic Partnerships Act, same-sex couples have more legal benefits than they previously enjoyed. This was a compromise bill, wasn't it, really? Absolutely. The risk it, 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 no clearer compromise that can be seen than the minister who led it. Because I would assume the risk of this not being passed would be to revert back to Mr. Ferbert's Oh, and there's, there's, same well, well, there, together. Well, there's many different risks, but the fact is that what, you, what we had, and I think that it's important to understand, though the judge said that same-sex couples were entitled to marry, 
the judge cannot give same-sex couples legal benefits. That is something that has to be done by Parliament. And just to be clear, I think it should be clear from the, what we saw in Parliament is that there is no appetite in Parliament for that. So what we have to do is that we have to figure out what it is that we can get a consensus to pass into law and to move forward on that. That is a place where the former government failed. They failed to build consensus. They failed to engage broadly on this issue. We engaged broadly on this issue. We got consensus and we moved this matter forward. So now that this matter has been dealt with, we can now focus on other issues such as education reform, reduce the cost of living, and in growing our economy and creating more jobs for Rudians. Lots of speculation about it now going to the governor, whether the governor will give it consent. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about that at all? I expect that the governor will uh, ratify the will of the parliament. How do you think history will remember this debate? Well, I think that history will remember it by a government that chose to be courageous in leading when other governments had failed. The fact is, governing is not easy. If there's one thing that I've learned over the last five months, it's not easy. And quite often, you have to make the best choice out of two bad decisions. In this particular instance, we came together as a cabinet. We discussed this issue, very lengthy debates inside of our caucus, and we arrived at a position where, in the very divergent views of the Progressive Labour Party caucus, we came to a position and a compromise position in saying, this is what we're going to support going forward. And quite frankly, I think that we should be applauded for that. Um, one of the other major things that's happened recently um, is the Cost of Living Commission, mm -hmm. what used to be called, I believe, the Price Commission. Yes. Um, when I was researching this yesterday, I accidentally actually came across uh, something, a Bernie story from July 2011. Okay. Uh, from Paula Cox. Uh, absolutely. Um, who said at the time in a statement to the mm -hmm. House, accordingly, government will use the powers of inquiry available under the Price Commission Act mm -hmm. to obtain information from food importers about their import costs, etc., etc. Mm -hmm talked about obtaining relevant economic data, mm -hmm. engaging interest groups, and then number seven, producing a report for the minister recommending how government can assist in ensuring that consumers can get the most reasonable price for essential goods and services. Correct. What happened to that report? Have you um, I don't believe that that report was ever published, to be honest. I've was seen, it done? Um, I do not believe it was. Oh. Um, I, d I don't believe it was. Um, I know there were interim reports that I've seen, but those interim reports were very uh, thin, and they spoke to future steps of which could be taken. Um, that, and what I think is also important is to understand and to recognize that the Price Control Commission did not meet during the entirety tenure of the One Bermuda Alliance government. I don't even think they were even appointed. And so from that perspective, we recognize that there are places inside of law where, we can, where, there, are, where there are things in place which will allow the power of inquiry to be used, and we're going to do that. And it's a broad cross-section. We talk about food, but there's also the cost of health care, cost of medicines, and different items. So as I told the parliament, the person who's going to be leading this for us is going to be uh, Senator Anthony Richardson. Mm -hmm. was he was actually on. Um, he was on the Price Commission before, and we're confident that we're going to be able to have that broad cross-section, have that discussion, and talk about this issue, which is the most important issue to the residents of this country. The cost of living and the cost of doing business is what is killing and crushing us, and we have to find a way to improve that. Okay, so what do you want to accomplish? I mean, you're talking broad strokes. Is there any more specific you'd like to see coming from this? Absolutely. Well, the, I can tell you what the specific result is a reduction in the cost of living in Bermuda. But it's a question of how you get from A to B. Absolutely. I'm not going to prejudge the work of the Cost of Living Commission. What I am going to say is that I believe there are places inside of our local economy where we can be more efficient, which can deliver lower prices for goods, uh, lower prices for consumers. Can you, can you be more specific? Can you explain um, that? Health insurance is one. I think when we're talking about uh, food uh, importers and food production, I think there's uh, food importers production and sale. I think there's places where we can be more um, efficient there to pass on savings towards consumers. Consumers. What would your idea of efficiency be? Uh, our idea of efficiency is possibly, I mean, in some cases, cutting out middlemen. Cutting? Cutting out middlemen, in some cases. Which would risk unemployment, perhaps. Um, well, in the, in the broad sense, someone would say it would risk unemployment. But if you Short look term. at, but if you exactly, but if you look at an economy as a whole, if you have a reduction of the cost of living, which means that the cost of doing business is less inside the country, that means that it allows other people, people to spend money in other areas in the economy, and you create additional growth in other places. Who do you regard as a middleman? Um, I can speak in food importers. Um, it would be food importers, the transportation, different things, all the rest. I mean, there's lots of different ways, but I think that we should look and study this 
in its entirety. We should not look to prejudge, but I think that there are places where you can be more efficient. I mean, another issue is when we talk about healthcare and prescription uh, medicines, which are extraordinarily expensive. Um, I think that I was at a, it was in, I was in London at the student reception and the lady was talking about her asthma medicine is like a pound in the UK and 50 something dollars here. There surely has to be a reason why that's the case. Well, in the UK, they are pumping extra <laughs> billions what, 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 of pounds a year. That, that's perfectly that. fine. But what I'm saying is, surely there's a way to find out where, how is that, why, why is that so different, and how can we get a better deal for the consumer here locally? In the UK, the taxpayer is paying for it. <laughs> well, it's well billions it, of pounds you, extra. You, but. That that much may be the case, but I think there's also space and scope to recognize that in certain places as well, the taxpayers may not pay for it, but we may be paying an extra extraordinary amount and we would want to play less. Just going back to, to the, to the, mid, to the middleman thing, mm -hmm. I mean, I can, I can kind of see that the, the larger businesses here will have the economies of scale, have mm -hmm. the infrastructure set up, where it might not have to have a middleman, but a small businessman needs a middleman. Yeah, but, uh, but here's the thing, Jeremy, it's 2017, the world is changing, the pace of logistics are changing, distributed leisure technology and the blockchain can make things more efficient in so far as supply chain management and otherwise. And we can look to how those efficiencies can actually uh, drill down to the consumer. And that is where this government is focused. I feel very sorry for the people who work in IT inside of the government of Bermuda because they have a leader uh, who understands information technology very clearly. And so when they come and say, oh, well, this is something that might take a while and all the rest, I say, I know exactly how long it should take and we need to start pushing and moving forward on these measures. But I do believe we're 10 minutes over time, Mr. Deacon. Um, I better move on. Can I just quickly, um, health costs are included in the, are going to be included in the review? Mm -hmm. What about uh, electricity? Well uh, electricity is a different matter. Um, electricity is something that belongs to the regulatory authority, so it's not necessarily something that's going to be under the purview of the price, uh, the cost of living commission. But electricity costs are something which are without question a challenge to what we're doing. Uh, I think that the uh, deputy premier spoke about the uh, way forward on energy, and I would strongly encourage you to have a discussion with him similar to this to um, inform uh, Bernie's uh, readers on where uh, we are going on our energy policy. I would also strongly suggest you talk to the Minister of Education so you can dig into what he's doing with the strategic plan. I have been trying to, so no hopefully problem. that will help. Oh, well, no problem. It's the last question, and we are running over time, as, as the Premier pointed out. Now, you have talked about population yes, I, I did. I, we were supposed to be here for 30 minutes. You I did say you give me extra time. <laughs> so I was pushing it. No problem. There is, there is one question I want to ask, because you touched on it a lot, and this oh. is the issue of population growth, growing the economy, mm -hmm. getting the number of people. I here. thought you were going to work. I asked him about road safety. I obviously haven't got time. Maybe I can ask that. Maybe that's the extra question I get in. Um, Minister of Economic Development, Jamal Simmons, he, he talked recently at the EY Global Reinsurance Outlook Forum. Exactly. Like one of the major goals is to get Bermuda's population back to where it was in the boom years, mm -hmm. 26, 27. When I interviewed Walden Brown in August for, for Bernier's, uh, he didn't quite seem to be so keen on that. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, we're not governed to benefit GDP, we're governed to benefit the people. What economic theory predicates on, it, on economic growth coming from more people? Mm -hmm. Where do you stand? Where's the, where's the government, where's the cabinet stand on this specifically? Because there is a little I, bit of discrepancy I, there between there, views. There, there, there may be different people who have different opinions, but I can tell you the opinion that matters most in the room, and that is mine. We will grow this economy, and the way we'll grow this economy is by having more people living and working in Bermuda. That is our job, that is our mission, and that is what we will execute. How will he do it? And how will he do that and put Bermudians first? Um, well, I think that when we talk in the broad context, if you want Bermudians to be first, what you have to make sure is you create additional opportunities for Bermudians to succeed. And I think that's part of the challenge that we have. We do not have enough opportunities for Bermudians here, and I think that's part of the challenge. So if we have more people living and working in Bermuda, that doesn't necessarily mean more expats living and working in Bermuda. That means more jobs located in Bermuda that will allow our people who are living overseas to come back to live um, and work inside of Bermuda. That's not going to go back to the boom years of 20, 2006, 2007. Well, um, well, you may think that. Uh, well, you I'm may asking think that. Question. No, no, th that's your opinion. In my opinion, oh, my, my, well, my, my thing is that you have to start somewhere. And in my view, you have to, you have to have the growth of the economy, more people living and working in Bermuda as your target and your focus, and design your policies around that. Final, final question, because mm -hmm. I know you're a busy man, and mm -hmm. I am going to ask you about road safety. Please you did do. say there would be roadside breath tests this mm -hmm. year. 
there doesn't seem to be any movement on that. You said this year, I said in this parliamentary session, and I can assure you that this government will keep its promise, as was laid out in its own speech, that we will have roadside sobriety testing in this parliamentary so session. So when you say we intend to enact this year, mm -hmm. you're not talking about the calendar year? Because that's, talk, that's an interpretation of it. I, what I will say is that it was promised inside of our throne speech. Our throne speech is, is, governs our entire parliamentary session, um, and it will happen in this parliamentary year. So parliamentary year, because mm -hmm. you do work quoted as saying enact this uh, year. My, uh, well, when, I, when I'm speaking this year, if it was from our throne speech, I can tell you what was laid out inside of our throne speech. Our throne speech says no, this that is we... A, this is a motion to adjourn debate. What I'm saying is that we will have... That's fine. We will have uh, roadside sobriety testing. We said that the items which are listed in our throne speech are things that we're committing to make sure that we enact this year. We've said that. There has been advanced work on that particular topic, and it will be random roadside sobriety testing because I don't want us to get into the place and position where blacks are more criminalized than non-blacks. That's always been an issue. It has it? been an issue and so we will do it right, we will do it correct, but we will do it in a way that will hopefully reduce the incidence and hopefully reduce the culture of um, drink driving in Bermuda. All right, Premier, on that note, thank you very much for sparing us some extra time. No problem. And I hope you have a great Christmas. Thank you very much. Take care.